eyes on an incoming storm across New Hampshire. High wind warnings kick into effect overnight. Mainly in the form of snow. And that snow will continue up north. Dangerous conditions, 70 mile per hour wind gusts. From the outside, people look at New England and think, why would you live there? And why would you ever be there in the winter? If there was no ice here, no Mount Washington, we would not be here. Conditions are variable. The weird patterns of melt freeze that we get here. The freeze thaw. With the volume of water, big things can form really quickly. Ice climbs that come into condition, drop out of condition, and then form in new ways and in different ways. This is one of the best ice climbing zones that I've ever been to. The weather is perfect for ice climbing. Unless, of course, it's too warm to ice climb. A new climate report from the United Nations comes with a dire warning, the risk New England may face. This report lists mounting dangers to people, plants, and... Last season was the worst winter that I've ever seen in my whole life. I rock climbed the whole winter. It was a really mild year. There was a week it hit 80 degrees in March, I remember. I've seen some bad ones, but I'd never seen anything like that. It was like the winter that didn't happen. One day it was 55 degrees and I was out riding my mountain bike. The next day it was like minus two. The seasons are just, you can't really depend on them. They seem to be kind of getting shorter. Later falls, the spring starting earlier. We did an avalanche course at Christmas and there was not one speck of snow anywhere in the state of New Hampshire. People are starting to ice climb around the same time as they used to, but it's more intermittent in the early season. I've always been an avid early season ice climber, trying to get out as soon as it seems reasonable. And still it seems like uh, a bit of a, a fleeting or even not a very smart endeavor to kind of uh, keep pushing it around the same dates that it used to be possible. Things seem to melt out earlier. I get this perspective that the season is shortening at the end. Less just pure warming and more just like kind of weirdness. I can't put my finger on it. I just know things are changing. This whole season, the entire season, I've been coming up here and I look across there and there's just nothing, it's just a blank face. But there's actually some ice for me now, which is really surprising. I'm not saying that it's in, but the fact that there's even any ice on there at all is pretty interesting. Any Climbs is a website that I started 17 years ago. Grade 5, it's not there yet, but it's definitely forming up, no question about it. Every Thursday, I'd go out and climb and then I'd write up something and post something. The pictures are 99% of the time taken from exactly the same place, which gives us the ability to see these climbs change every week over a period of 17 years. Ice climbing is a fool's errand. You're climbing an ephemeral structure. You're climbing something that appears when it's frozen and disappears when it's warm. It's a constantly changing medium. Things get shocked and released and they get reformed. Just this dynamic nature of ice that makes you have to understand ice. This freeze-thaw cycle is really what makes everything happen. To make ice, you need these two things that almost seem like they're opposites. Enough cold to form ice, by definition is 32 degrees or below, and you need enough warmth so that the water that's making this ice continues to flow. If you don't have both of those things, you don't have ice formations. So far as, you know, pure waterfall ice, the quality, longevity, and size is definitely changed uh, and diminished. It's 
It's not the same. In 76, 77, a year when many of the biggest ice climbs that we've ever seen came in in this area. They had a good snowfall early on. The temperatures are really good, cold at night, warm in the daytime, but it wasn't sunny, actually. There are two years in a row, and I don't know what that means in terms of the overall climate thing, but it was cloudy, and these climbs formed huge. Climbs that never come in were huge. It's amazing the size of these ice clumps at that time. Now, no, there's nothing like that now. They're just not as large. They don't last as long. The quality is dubious. You just don't see roots on south or solar aspects hang in long enough to grow that kind of mass. It's just rare. Like when Willoughby comes in now or Cannon comes in now, and those are counting on like a splashdown, like a big rain event followed by a hard freeze. The statistics prove what you can see and what you can sense, that there is much less snow, less water, combined with less coal, gives you less ice. A lot of the work that I do as a scientist is focused on winter climate change, and specifically in the northeastern United States. It's very clear we have lost cold temperatures, we've lost snow cover, and the overall sustained cold period in winter is shortened by about three weeks over the past 100 years. So in our study, we were looking at historical records of ice conditions with Al Hosper's beautiful record of photographs, and we wanted to see how temperature changes are influencing the ice formation. And what's great is Pinkham Notch, right nearby, has a wonderful temperature record that goes back plenty of time, and we can compare that to what models say. We can then use these climate models to project what's going to happen into the future. What these climate models show is that as temperatures warm, the ice climbing season length decreases. If we act in lower emissions of heat trapping greenhouse gases, we can maintain at least 75 days of decent climbing conditions by the end of the century. But if we continue to emit greenhouse gases on a high emission scenario, the season length could be as short as 30 days by 2100. The guiding community already knows what's happening. They notice that winters are getting warmer. They notice that there's fewer days, that they're safe climbing. It's intermittent or thawing events that are happening in midwinter. And I notice this as a scientist too. When I go out and sample in February and it's 70 degrees and I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt and there's no snow, that's challenging. Have you all noticed changes in the reliability of ice over the course of your climbing career? Which routes have been the most affected? Routes that are particularly important for you all as guides where you've seen those major changes in reliability? There's no doubt that the seasons are shorter and they're also uh, less consistent. The full thaw, like the gully washing rain events, things go, go totally out of condition. Even the classics, it's like unsafe to be on the main routes. You cannot rely on, as the word reliability, you cannot rely on a steady stream of clients or you have your dates set up. I want to go February 2nd. Oh, I'm sorry, it rained two days prior or whatever. So it's definitely an impact. Like this workshop, should we cancel it? Should we not cancel it? The conditions aren't safe, but yet it's within that February range, which is usually a really dependable time to plan a workshop and guide in the winter time. I think from a guiding perspective, you want to give your guests a good experience and you'd like there to be kind of truth in advertising as far as like, if you want to come out and be guided on an ice climb, you want to be able to schedule a date in advance and have people show up and give them a good experience. And I think good experiences can look like a lot of different things, but if they have an idea in their mind of, of what winter is gonna look and feel like and what the medium of ice climbing is gonna be and feel like, you wanna show that to them. And when that piece is outside of your control, that puts a, a different pressure on you as a guide to support them in what they want, but also to uh, hold the line on what's safe and reasonable to go out and, and do on that scheduled day. One of the important insights from the projections that we've produced 
is that we have a range of future ice scenarios depending on what we do with greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, the projections show that regardless of what we do, we are looking at experiencing climate-related changes in the ice climbing season. And that then calls attention to the intrinsic need for adaptation. Unfortunately, climbers are a group of people that spend a considerable amount of time in environments that are inherently changeable, and there's a lot of knowledge and capacity to respond to these changing conditions. Good guides make the day about their clients. You need to have a lot of plan Bs in your pocket. You have to think on your feet a little bit more because of that variability, and you also have the arsenal of options. A lot of it is communication. Ask them how it's going and talk to them about it and find out like whether there's something missing for them and what that might be, and then fix it if you can. And if you can't, then you gotta then you gotta figure it out. Sometimes you, they, people cancel. Sometimes you gotta give them their money back. Sometimes you give them a credit and they come back another time. I think in a lot of ways we're lucky here in that we're used to the weather changing. It just dumped 18 inches of snow outside. The ice climbing all fell down and then reformed a week later. It's nuts. We're used to that here. That's gonna give us a little bit more of a nimble footing in adapting to what's happening with climate change and what's happening with the weather. We all know something has changed, but I don't think any one of us is going to stop guiding. We just have to adapt. As I approach you know, my late 60s, I know that I won't see probably the worst of it, but I'm not going to stop. If it's 25 below zero, I'm, I'm gonna be outside doing something because I wanna know what that cold still feels like. What I hope this study can do is help communicate to the ice climbing community that this is impacting you. And the good news is that we can do something about that. Once you acknowledge the problem, it's time to take action. When I go to DC with the American Alpine Club and I talk to my representatives, I tell them that I'm not just a scientist. I tell them that I'm a skier. Our stories, our experience is critical for them to make their arguments for policy change. Oh, I love the sound of that. We're going to have to adapt no matter what, but there is a chance to get things back on the right track. We at the AAC see this as an opportunity to engage our community, to train our grassroots network, to partner with them in outdoor advocacy, and to bring our community to DC to advocate for immediate action on climate change. If we can make change now, if we can get back onto a decarbonization pathway, we may have a shot.